How, I, how is everyone today? Good. All right. This morning, I thank God for the opportunity to be here to share the word of God with you. And I'll start with a very short story. In the airport, this very nervous passenger was pacing up and down the terminal. And it is because his flight was delayed due to bad weather. And as he was walking around, he came across a machine that was selling insurance. And it says that it offered a payout of $100,000 in the event of an untimely death on board a flight. And the policy only cost $3. So as he looked out at the window, at the clouds that was threatening, dark clouds, swirling wind, impending storm, and then he thought about his family, his wife and his kids. And he said, for that price, it'd be foolish if I don't take up the policy. And so he put the money into the machine and he took the cover. And then he was happy and he was hungry and he wanted to find a place to eat. You know, in the airport, there are many eateries, but he chose his favorite, it was Chinese food. So he went in, ordered, and had a relaxing meal but at the end of the meal, he received a fortune cookie. And guess what he said? Your recent investment will pay big dividends. <laughs> Whoa, that's worrying, isn't it? Yes, it's worrying. So today, I'm going to share with you how to have a victorious Christian life by overcoming worry. To start off, this is what some famous people say or think about worry. John Lubbock, he's a 19th century baron, politician and banker. He said, a day of worry is more exhausting than a day of work. That's true. Huh? And Leo F. Buscalia said, he's a professor, author, and a motivational speaker. He said, worry never robs today, tomorrow of its sorrow. It only saps today of its energy. So if you begin to worry today, you lose your joy and your energy. And then Henry Ward Beecher, he said, every tomorrow has two handles. We can take hold of it with the handle of anxiety or we can take it with the handle of faith. Which will you choose? We can either approach life in faith or in worry. But which will you choose? So today, I want to tell you, worry is a terrible thing it impacts every part of our lives, our body, our soul, and our spirit. Why do I say that? Number one, it impacts us physically. Uh, it is said that chronic worrying can affect your daily life and may interfere with your appetite, your lifestyle habits, your relationships, sleep, and your job performance. And many people who worry excessively are so anxiety-ridden that they seek relief in harmful lifestyle habits, such as overeating. Do you know people who are stressed, and when they are stressed, they need to eat something? So they get stressed throughout the day, they eat throughout the day, overeat. Then there are people who can't help but smoke, okay? One cigarette after another, and become chain smoker. Some indulge in alcohol and drugs, and this is taken from WebMD. Worry is bad for your physical health. Tell your neighbor, worry is bad for your health. <laughs> worry also impacts us emotionally. From the Stress SG website, it states, anxiety is strongly linked to depression because after many failed attempts at trying to cope and avoid anxiety, you can spiral into dysthymia or depression. <coughs> And worry also impacts us spiritually. The founder of the Biblical Foundation for Freedom, Paul J. Bucknell, said, Worry results in an unfruitful life. Mark 4.19 says, But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Think about that. And then he says, worry stops us from listening to God's word 
And in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 22, it reads, The seed falling among the thorns refer to someone who hears the word, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and make it unfruitful. And then worry takes away our peace. And if you look at Philippians 4, 6 and 7, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So if you are anxious, you won't have peace. But if you are not anxious by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, you release the anxiety to God. His peace will come upon you and will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Now, worry affects all of us in the modern day. Uh, we, we all have some kind of worry or other, don't we? And some of the daily worries that every one of us encounter will include your work, your children, your spouse, your life partner, or lack of one, your finance, your health, etc., etc. Let's face it, this is the real world. But let's look at the Bible and what it has to say about worry and how we can overcome it. I'm taking a passage from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 24, 25 to 34. Let's read it together. It's on the screen. Ready? One, two, go. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap. So, Are you not more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add another day to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet, I tell you, even not Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of them. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all this, and your heavenly Father who knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know, in these ten short verses, the word worry appeared six times. Why? God is trying to tell us not to worry. Do not worry. And so, from these verses, I can find three key truths that we can learn how we can overcome worries in our life. Are you ready? Yeah. The first way to overcome worry is to trust God to be the supplier of your needs. Trust God to be the supplier of your needs. We can trust God to be the supplier of all our needs. Why? Because we are of great value to God. We are of such great value to Him. If you look at the text in verse 26, it says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than them? Of course we are. You can see from this verse, God really takes care of His creation. The birds are of little value. The birds are just tiny creatures flying around, carefree. You know? They don't work like us human beings do. They don't sow and reap. They don't store away in barns. They don't plan their lives. They're just carefree flying around. Yet, they have food to eat, flying from tree to tree, going to the ground and pecking at seeds. They don't worry and they don't lack anything. Why? Because God meets every of their needs. 
Now, if God can take care of them, something so insignificant, unimportant, then surely God can take care of you. Because you, you and I, we are more precious to Him than the birds. Friends, we are God's prized possession. We are the only creature in the whole wide world that is made in His image. We are the only creature in the whole universe that God breathed into us so that we have life. We are so precious to Him that He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, to go to the cross to die for our sins. Scripture says, if God has given you His Son, will He not give you everything else? So when we receive Christ, we become His children. Let me ask parents here, if your children have pressing need and they come to you, will you not provide for them? The answer, obviously, is yes. Scripture says then, if we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will God provide for us? If we can give the things that our children need, God will definitely give us more. Therefore, trust God to provide for you because you are so valuable to Him. And we can also trust God to be our supplier because He is a generous God. He is a generous God. If you look at the verses 28 to 30, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet, I tell you, not even Solomon, and Solomon is the richest and most powerful king in biblical time. Huh? Not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. See, God is such a generous God. If he can dress the flowers so magnificently, so beautifully, and these flowers are, are little things that is not important, and the lifespan is so short, a week, maybe a month, and then it's thrown into the fire or it withers and dies. And if these are so unimportant and God is still so generous to clothe them, what do you think God will do to you? He will clothe you and dress you better than the flowers. And He will dress you better than the richest, most powerful man on earth. So we should trust this same generous God to provide for our every need. Why? Because we are more important than the flowers and the insects and birds. If he so lavishly dresses unimportant things like flowers, birds and insects, you can be sure he can dress you better. Have faith in God. That's what I tell you. Have faith in God. Okay? Some years back, I attended a class uh, in the Bible school and one of the practicum was uh, spiritual pediatrics. What we had to do was one afternoon, all of us had to individually spend an hour in the in the forest or in the, in the uh, wilderness, so to speak. The whole idea is to be alone by yourself for an hour to ponder and think about God's marvelous creation. And in that hour, when I was walking around, first I took a marker and marked a little grass, blade of grass. And as I walked around, I could see birds chirping around, taking food from one point to another, carefree. I could see insects scuttling around. I could see beautiful flowers and birds were coming to take honey from the flowers, etc. But as I exited at the end of the hour, I noticed that that blade of grass had grown. And suddenly it dawned on me that this wonderful God who made all these plants and birds and insects created me as well. And if he could provide for them these things, he would be able to give me better and more things. It was a revelation moment for me right there. And it was so refreshing. I also remember some years back when I was doing my own business uh, in logistics. Every year, I'll have my biggest customer from Canada visit twice a year. Each time he will come for five to seven days, I'll fetch him in my Honda Accord and then every meal, every meeting, I'll be with him. But in that particular year, 
when he came to Singapore, he sent me a telefax the day before and said, on the second day, we have breakfast, and then I have a meeting. I'll see you in the office at 2 o'clock. And I began to worry. Why? Because he's the biggest customer, and for several years, I know that my competitors were eyeing him, were looking at wanting to steal his business. And so I began to worry. The second day, I went to have breakfast with him at Marina Mandarin. After the breakfast, he said, okay, I'll see you in the office. I went off, but I didn't go off. I had a high at the corner, and I was waiting to see who is coming to fetch him. <laughs> Nine o'clock, lo and behold, a Mercedes 300 SEL came with a driver, and my competitor came out and fetched him. He went to the office. He came at 2 o'clock, no? and then, like nothing happened. And I was so stressed that day, I didn't know what was happening. That evening, I went back, I began to pray. I began to pray the Lord's Prayer. I began to pray Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. I began to pray Philippians 4, 6, 7 and pray and pray and pray. But you know something? After I prayed Philippians 4, 6, 7, the peace of God came upon me. I did not have to worry. So for the rest of the week, I didn't think about that incident at all until the day when he was flying off and I sent him to the airport. Then he looked at me at the airport after he took his uh, boarding pass. You know, Andrew, your competitor had been looking to me. I went to his office. I saw all his possibilities. They are really great. And he won my business. But I tell you what, I will stay with you. Because, because you give me very good service. At that moment, you know, like a ton of weight, nah, just, <laughs> just lifted. And I was so glad. I thank God. Nah, praise the Lord. Because why? Friends, when you trust God to supply your needs and you have faith in God, huh, He will take care of you. If He can take care of the flowers and the birds, He will certainly take care of me. And the way that I did was I gave thanks, and I prayed, and I put my petition to the Lord. In Philippians 4, 6, 7, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, prayer by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So that was what happened to me. It's practical. And I assure you, if you will begin to put your faith in God and in every situation with petition and thanksgiving, pray and submit it to God. Let the peace of God come upon you. The second way to overcome worry is to put God first in all things. Put God first in all things. Okay? Verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What does this verse mean? It's a famous verse, but it teaches us to put God first in all things, and then he will ensure that your supply never ends. So what does it mean? It means, if you look at John chapter 4 and verse 34, he says, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus' whole mandate when he was on earth was to do the will of the Father and to finish his work. Figuratively speaking, the kingdom of God was what Jesus was eating every day. That was what he did. And for us, for us, we can seek the kingdom of God and it is for us to be like Jesus to do the will of God. And doing the will of God should be the first priority in our lives and it is more than, more than just serving. Huh? Okay, I know all of us serve, all of us, in one way or another we are serving, but doing the will of God is more than serving. It's how we make our decisions. Sometimes if we have tough decisions to make, we can pray, you know, Lord Jesus, what would you do? Remember, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Okay? When you have tough decisions to make, and every day, even simple decisions, submit to the Lord. It's how we surrender our will to God. Sometimes God tells us to do something, but we say, no, cannot, too difficult. But you have to do it. If God whispers to you and tells you, you have to obey. Then you can submit your will, surrender your will to God. 
the third thing is to prioritize your time. Prioritize your time for the Lord. We can focus our energy and our resources on doing God's will in our life, and then you can be sure He will take care of your needs. He will take care of your worries. Okay? The main problem with a lot of us is we worry too much and we don't trust God to supply our needs. So what do we do? We strive. We strive to make ends meet. We strive to uh, do whatever is needed so that as we continue to do and struggle, we neglect and forget the kingdom of God. We lose priority. So God looking down from heaven, he will say, ah, well, if you're working, then I don't have to work. I don't have to work on your behalf. You can go ahead and strive. But if you seek first the kingdom, then God says, okay, I'll do the supplying. How does that sound? All of you know, ah, I'm semi-retired, and the last eight months or so, I've been helping Pastor Sabrina in the church plant. Every day, when we get, get up in the morning, we'll be discussing what we have to do today, to plan things, uh, prepare sermon, ensuring that whatever is needed in church is available. Have to go and buy things, have to meet vendors, have to, people are delivering, have to rush back here, open the door for them, etc., etc. On top of that, every day go for the revival prayer meeting. Today we are at 181 or 182 days. Huh? Yes, thank God. And every morning, we are talking and discussing about RCA, nothing else. Every night, before we shut our eyes and sleep, we are praying all the various agendas. Seriously, praying. Thanking God and noting, and then noting down, what do we have to do tomorrow? Yet, when we focus on God first and His kingdom, I assure you, whatever we need, God has provided. We are not in lack, and I thank God for that. Each month, we have enough to pay the bills, and when we need to go for a short break, like uh, later this month, we hope to go short break. Huh? Yeah, we are able to do so. Okay, so I encourage all of you to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and see how God will add all these things unto you. If somehow today I'm talking to you, you know you are not so regular in church. Some Sundays you are here, some Sundays you are not because Saturday you are tired, you are working, etc. Okay. Or you feel that uh, you have to work very hard. Even Sundays you have to work because you've got to meet, ends meet. Or you are striving for a promotion. If you, are, if you don't, you are afraid you might lose out to your colleague or something. Can I encourage you today, when you hear this, learn to apply this into your life. Learn to apply. I saw fingers pointing around. <laughs> I know a resonant property agent. He's a cell leader. And he is the one who made a decision not to see customers on sale nights, not to see customers in service time slots, like now he's sitting in the service, and we are all when he has other ministry commitments. He is also a prayer leader. Daily, daily revival prayer, he's one of the leaders. And sometimes when the other leaders are not available, he is always okay to stand in, make himself give him, make, make the time to stand in. And let me tell you, when he made this decision, it's not easy because it involves sacrifices. He had to sacrifice time away from family, from his children, and from some of the appointments he needs for work. And in the process, he may lose some sale. But I tell you something, God has been blessing him with extraordinary sales. In fact, he won the top manager award in the company. Can you be that? When he chose to... Put God first, yes. You know, God will, God will, God will honour you. When he seek the kingdom of God first, God add these things unto him. What are these things he need? Sales. Today he's so happy, you know. One deal after another. I say, wow. But uh, let me tell you, in the above two illustrations that I've given to you, it does not mean that we just seek God and serve him and then do nothing and God will add. I mean, you sit on the hammock, yeah, then just relax, then yeah, seek God and heal. No, 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 no such thing, okay? We still need to work hard because work is biblical. It's in the Bible, we need to work. 
Okay? But we, what we do is to know that when we do work, God will bless the work of our hands and we don't need to strive and strike a balance between seeking, serving and working. When we are able to do that, I assure you, God will take care of you. Okay, the third way we can overcome worry is to take it one day at a time. If you look at verse 34, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What does that mean? To overcome worry, it's important not to take tomorrow's burden today. Are you, are you able to do that? Wow, what's going to happen tomorrow? Huh? Better worry about it now. Okay? Remember, God gives us the grace and the strength to handle today's work. He didn't give us the grace and strength to handle tomorrow's work or what is meant for tomorrow. Okay? If we take the burden of tomorrow and try to handle it today, I tell you, you will burn up. You will burn up. Okay? Scripture says, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What does that mean? God's mercy is new for us every morning. And He is faithful. Every morning, He will give you new mercies, new grace to handle that day's work, that day's worries. So go, don't go and worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow come first. You know? He gives us new mercy. I recall a passage in Exodus chapter 16, verses 4 to 5, 12 to 16, and verse 20. If you recall that, you, you will, when I say it, you will remember. It is the time when God tested the Israelites to trust Him on a day-to-day -day basis. That chapter is all about the story of how God reigned manna. You see, the Israelites, when they came out from Egypt and they were in the wilderness, they had no food. So they cried to Moses, we have no food. And God, uh, Moses in, interceded and prayed to God and God said, I will give you food. And he rained manna down every day. And he, but he specifically told the Israelites, you will take what you need for that day. And then every day I will supply to you. But some of the Israelites, they didn't trust. So what did they do? They take extra for tomorrow. But when they woke up the next day, there were maggots and the manna was rotting. The only time they had to take or they could take two days portion was the day before the Sabbath because you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Okay? So this is the account that we can trust God. But here again, it does not mean that we don't plan for tomorrow. We are God's steward of His resources. We should plan ahead. Okay? If you look at verse 33 again, uh, Matthew 6, 33 again, it says that do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough of its own, trouble of its own. So the whole idea is to trust God and not to worry. Okay? Do you know what is going to happen in Singapore at the end of this year? We're in March now, uh, another nine months now. What is going to happen in December? You don't know. In fact, what is going to happen next month, April? I also don't know. Or next week? I also don't know. Do you know if tomorrow the east-west line or the north-south line is going to break down? You won't know. I don't know. Does SMRT know? No. <laughs> if it happens, it will happen, right? Do you know if there's going to be an earthquake that's going to hit South China Sea somewhere deep down? And it's going to cause a tsunami so great huh, that it will sweep into our little red dot. I don't know. Do you? We can't and we should not worry about what is going to happen in the future. Let the future come and then we see how we can handle it. But for today, we simply handle today's issues. Okay? John Newton, who is the famous writer who penned the hymn, Amazing Grace. He said, we can easily manage if we will only take each day the burden appointed to it. But the load will be too heavy for us if we carry yesterday's burden over again today 
and then you add the burden of tomorrow before we are required to bear it. How not to burn out if you do this? You got problems today, you still add yesterday's problems, and then you add on tomorrow's problems. You'll be like a ton on your shoulder, like how I felt, you know? So, remember, in application, uh, firstly, commit yesterday's worries to the Lord. Yesterday is already finished. Okay, no more. Finito. So, if yesterday's worry is finished, just commit to the Lord. Say, Lord, that's all I can do. Then, seek God for the wisdom to handle today's worries. His mercies are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. So, you can call on God today and He will be with you today. And then, don't worry about tomorrow. Seek the Lord again when the new dawn begins. He said His mercies are new every morning. New every morning. So when the new day starts, you ask God again, Oh, help me, O oh God. Okay? Now I'd like, to hear, I'd like you to hear a song that is very meaningful and it, it relates very well to this last point. If we saw it should be one day. I'm only human. I'm just a man. Help me believe in what I could be and all that I am. Show me the stairway. I have to climb. Lord, for my sake, teach me to take one day at a time. One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking from you. Give me the strength to do everything. Yesterday is gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. Help me today, show me the way, one day at a time. Lord, for my 
Yesterday's worries, don't think about tomorrow's worries, but just for today, the Lord will be with you and He will guide you every day. When you ask Him, He will give to you. So, to overcome worry, you must number one, trust God to be the supplier of your needs. Number two, put God first in all things. And number three, take it one day at a time. You know, when you turn your worries, into worship, God will turn your battles and your burdens into blessings. Agree? Hallelujah. 